first got to England, to London, how did it go? Oh, it started off really slowly because our first tour got canned. Uh, we were supposed to be touring with Paul Kossoff, um, uh, Backstreet Crawler. Right. Uh, and, you know, when we were pre preparing to go over there, Kossoff was on his way, way back to England. And, uh, you know, we, we knew he, he'd had some troubles in, in the past with his, his uh, shall we say, lifestyle choices. And uh, it, it did a lot of, obviously did a lot of damage to himself because he, he actually died in his sleep on a plane, and so uh, that you know, that was our first <coughs> tour because we were the same record company and same agency, and uh, so we, we were basically sitting on our ass for the first month over there. Uh, so it was a, it was a bit quiet, but it was in a way it worked out good, uh, not so much for Kossoff, of course, but uh, it gave us some time to settle in and go see a lot of bands over there. Uh, Backstreet Crawler end up getting together and we, we end up doing probably half the tour anyway. They grabbed another guitar player. So, uh, you know, th that introduced us to the Marquee, which we became our power base in London. We, we did two nights of the Marquee supporting Backstreet Crawler. But we went and saw a lot of bands with some bands, bands sort of like Kiss. I uh, went and saw, uh, you know, bands Eddie and the Hot Rods and all the bands that were supposed to come. We went and saw the, I went and saw the Sex Pistols a couple, a couple of times. And when we got over there, we were expecting to see all these bands that were just like right on, like the, these bands are going to be hot over there. We went over there and saw the bands, supposed to be the happening bands, and just went, man, these guys stink. You know, like there was, there was all these punk bands, like they, they had a lot of vibrance, uh, they had a lot of energy, yeah, but um, we were stunned. It, it just seemed to be a whole bunch of bands that couldn't even get in tune. So... You know, we realised at that stage, um, you know, we were in the right place, you know. And we had an added advantage. We ambushed a lot of bands because, you know, we were a new band. We would go out and play the Marquee or um, the Nashville Rooms or the, the, the Greyhound and perform all the, all the happening gigs. And people would come and see us for the first time because there was a lot of press about it. And they'd, they'd, they'd see the band and say, Sounds like these guys have played 500 gigs. We had. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know, you know. Yeah. And we, we'd been on the road for solid for 18 months. So we, we were ready to go. So it was, once again, it was, you know, fortunate the way that happened that we could go into an area like, like London where it was still relatively easy to build up a street vibe because it was, you know, you could go and do two or three gigs and people would start talking about you. You could kick up some dust quite <coughs> easily. And uh, we had the advantage that we, we were just ready to go. And after we saw what, you know, bands were on our level over there, we just, we sort of really knew that they're the bands we shouldn't be targeting, we should be looking further in. And we'd go see bands like the Stones. We, we saw them at the Earl's Court. And there were Stones. I'm a massive Stones fan. But that was right in the area where probably the Stones were wandering a bit. They, mm -hmm. Black and Blue just came out. And I think... I've read in, in Keith's biography that the, the, the Earl's Court shows they did with, the, I think the, I think he might have, they don't look at them with great fondness because mm. it was a, a time when, you know, they were probably, you know, losing their way. And we thought, well, if this is the Stones, they're the greatest rock and roll band. And we looked at those guys as being a blueprint because we'd go in the studio and Malcolm would say, oh, this song, you know, we're going to do this. This is live wire, you know. This would be this would be this would be, like, be like our street fighting man, you know. You, 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 we use use those guys as a blueprint, you know. Um, so we saw the Stones. You just went, well, if this is if this is it, you know, we're not too far off, you know. It, it and it, it's probably because we're such arrogant bastards too that that. You know, you, you can go in, 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 and we were nothing, and you go see the Stones and say, well, we can knock these guys off. No, we were, we were very arrogant, and it, it seems like crazy now. It seems like misplaced that we, that we would do that, but that's what we believed. And I think maybe the proof's in the pudding. You know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it makes sense now, you know. But we were just going to go in and do the hard work, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I lived in, in Chicago for in the early 80s and I, I never thought I, an Australian band would be big over there and I, someone put the radio on and it was ACDC and I... Well, I think there was, there was an advantage 
of, of the way that, that it worked for the band. Like, we started off here from, like, zero and uh, worked really hard for 12 months and we went to England and we were nothing. Um, so we started building up in, in London first and UK through the tours. Then we'd go to Europe with Black Sabbath. Once again, no one knew us again. We were zero again. I think it was a real advantage that the band kept on going into territories where no one knew us because what it did, it kept the band really grounded, you know. Uh, so you were always working at something. It wasn't like, oh, you know, well, what about this? We're stars, you know. It was never any... Well, you couldn't do that with that, that, that band anyway because if you got out of hand and, you know, started, you know, turning up and, you know, you know, fancy jacket every second night, you'd be, you know, who do you think you are, Mark Bolan? You know, you, you, you'd get foot down the sides pretty pretty quickly. By who? Oh, anyone in the band, you know. It's just you, you, you couldn't get carried away with yourself because you'd be, you know, you know a couple of times I, I'd, I'd be sort of doing things and, and messing around with bass things at, at um, sound check and the next thing you say, who do you think, who the <laughs> do you think you are, Jack Bruce? You know, like, and you go, that's right, okay, I'll get back to it, you know. So <laughs> it was, you know, it was, it was done, you know, it was done in good humour, but it was, it was certainly very, very direct. You could never get carried away with yourself, you know. That's that's the way it was with the band. But that, that, that going into territories where you're unknown, and I can only assume that happened again after I yeah, finished yeah, yeah. In, in America, I think I think it was very beneficial for the band. You never did go to America, though, did you? Uh, got close, yeah. but yeah, fell at the last hurdle. Yeah, we were, we were doing a, a tour um, with Black Sabbath, and uh, the plan was to do the tour. We'd, we'd go through France, Germany, all, all, all the way up into Scandinavia, finish in Helsinki, and then we were going to fly directly from Helsinki to New York to start in, in the States. Anyway, we made it about halfway through the tour with Black Sabbath, and we got thrown off the tour. We got kicked off. Why? Uh, legend has it, no, I, I, I'm, I'm the cleaning guy. Nothing to do with me this time. Um, but uh, evidently, from the myth says uh, I wasn't there at the, uh, at the time, so I, I just go from hearsay. But uh, there was a, there was a problem between Malcolm and the bass player from Black Sabbath, and it was a you know geezer. Yeah, a bit bit of a bit of a punch up, I believe. Uh, and once again. Yeah, I believe it happened at their hotel, which was, which is odd, you know, just none of us would really sort of go out of the way and go back to the Black Sabbath Hotel, but um, yeah, so it was a bit of a bit of a problem then when we got thrown off the tour, um, and that's when we ended back in in London, and that's that's when uh, I, I, I copped a chop then, but yeah, but uh, that's that's basically how it all came around. I love the story you tell about the uh, how the pipe. And uh, thing, the bagpipe thing got into uh, yeah, a long way to the time. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's a great idea. It's it, 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 we recorded that that song, a uh, long way to the top, and that was um, pretty much you know how we would record. We, we Mal Malcolm was got this groove going, and and the George said, oh, "Listen, you know, wait a minute, you know, got the tape going." And it was basically come out of a, you know, like a jam that we did. And um, George, you know, overnight sort of worked on it and did a fair bit of editing because George is, you know, like amazing. He'd be in front of the, the tape machine, cutting bits out, and like a tailor around here and putting that back in there. And uh, he, he basically yeah, did, a, did a job on that and, and put it together because you'll, you'll note... Um, even with the guitar, from the guitar intro to how the guitar is at the end, it's very, very, very different. It, but it, it flows, it works well, and it works well because of George, he's just, you know, that's where it's... So anyway, um, George suggested it needed something in the middle, he said, suggested bagpipes, and Bond said, great, yeah, I used to play in a pipe band. Oh, did that, was fantastic. So Bond said, I'll be back. So he went down to a music shop down the road in Park Street, and you know, a bagpipes are us. Well, I don't know what it was called. <laughs> and uh, I went and put this set of hardy pipes. And we said, I even remember they were four hundred and seventy nine dollars, which was like back in those days, you know. Um, yeah, it got, a, a normal Joe Schmo was probably picking up a hundred bucks a week. 
Mm. So, an yeah. offender of Stratton or Gibson, Les Paul were like three hundred. Oh yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. Well, it was probably you would have got two Strats. Yeah. For, for these, so there we go. So he's got this this box. Hey, I've got the five. Okay. Now, if you want a good laugh, man, you get three Scotsmen together <laughs> around trying to put a set of bagpipes together. <laughs> man, it's like, it's like a Scottish Scottish Rubik's cube. <laughs> it was, and they're swearing and oh man, oh, that's, and they say. George said to, to Bond, said, listen, yeah, yeah, you used to play in a pipe band, you know, you, 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 what's going on? He said, yeah, well, yeah, he played in a pipe band. I was a drummer. <laughs> so that was it. Oh, man. So we, we ended up getting the pipes together. We ended up getting it to, we recorded, we got the, got the, the drones. We ended up blowing those individually and the tape looped. And then Bond got the chanter because he used to play flute or, or recorder and stuff. Oh, and yes, I remember him in that fraternity. fraternity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're playing play record. So he, he, he got, got the notes out. And um, we made a tape loop, and then at the start of it, there's a, you know, we hold on to the tape, let it go, so it was just... <laughs> you know? So it's, it's all George, it's, it's George's stuff, you know. It came a bit of a hassle when we were working live, because we'd have to tune up to the, the drone. <laughs> so they'd, they'd, they'd poor, our, poor old Ralph, Ralph, the front of the house guy, if we had the cassette player, we'd backstage, tune up to the drone, out the front, put the drone, okay, hit the drone now for this, and bond it out the channel, and oh man. So, in essence, it, it sort of it crueled us from playing the song much live. And, you know, from my memory, I, I would say um, we probably played this song live maybe 30 times most, and the band's never played it since then. So, it's such, a, it's a, it's, it's such a, an odd thing. It's, it's, it's converse because it's such an iconic ACDC song. Like, if you say to people, particularly here in Australia, name an ACDC song, it's will say a long way to the top. Yeah. But the band probably only, you know, I may be out a few times, but I would say 30 times would be the maximum we played it on stage. And the band's, I'm sure the band's never played it since. So yeah, You don't see it in the live DVDs? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. think so. So, um, yeah, so it's probably the most famous song of the band. In fact, I've heard a couple of bootlegs of it, uh, and we're playing it. It's almost like a Chuck Berry thing. It's really fast, and it's quite different from the recording. You know, but so, yeah, so that that's that's strange. It's never really sort of been in the live set much at all. Mm. But but then you, it's there. You know, it's very Bond, isn't it? Yeah. What are the tunes you're most proud of of that period that you were with them that you like the most? Um, I I really gravitate towards the Let There Be Rock album. You know, um, because it to me, um. Probably the worst guy to ask that question to, but um, to me that Let the Rock is where, where the band, to me really, that's a watershed album for the band. That's when it really starts sounding like the band. Like the, all the stuff before is great too. Like a long way to the top, and it, and, and the, the very first album with I, I had nothing to do with with Baby Please Don't Go. It, it's all it's all great that stuff. But I think Let There Be Rock uh, because of the time we recorded it. It, that's really where it starts sounding like the band, and there's there's, some, there's things like whole whole lot of Rosie, uh, and my, probably my favourite song is Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be, and it's it's just it's just got that swagger to it. And it sounds like ACDC. Um, we had a, a big point to prove at that time when we were recording that album too, because uh, we'd come back to Australia. That was January 1977. When we were recording it. Um, we come back to Australia. The tour here in Australia that we were doing wasn't going all that well. We kept on getting banned from places. Our program from the gig got banned. You know, we were getting trashed in the media, and it's like, what are we doing back here? You know. Uh, plus, the Dirty Deeds album, which we were promoting at that stage, um, our American com record company had knocked it back. They weren't going to release it, or they didn't release it. They subsequently they released it after Bond passed away and um, strangely enough it's at the largest selling ACDC album with the Bond appears on so mm. you know maybe who knows you know if they had released it at that time what would have happened who I, I don't know you know mm. that's one of those things that you'll, you'll never know the answer to mm. it's like you know that's like the, having the, the record coming up on the grassy knoll you know <laughs> who knows what's going to go on but um yeah, yeah. When we recorded "Let There Be Rock," we we really had a point to prove. We wanted to make a record that was really going to shove it up the American. 
that uh, record company because it was, you know, it was a real slap in the face because, you know, they're saying the record's not good enough. And it, you get, get different things back in, different things over there. They didn't like the production. They didn't like the sound of the vocals. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. And uh, over the Christmas period of 76, uh, the, the ATCO, our American company, they, they were, they were, um, they, they, they dropped the band. They, they, they were out. They didn't want to know about it. And it's only through uh, Phil Carson, who signed us up in England, and Michael Browning, um, at the time, uh, the manager of the band, who's Michael's, Michael's input uh, and, uh, you know, legacy he left the band can't be understated. You know, without Michael coming on board and doing what he did, I, I don't think we, we're, we're here talking about the band. You know? mm-hmm. uh, but, yeah, Michael and, and Phil uh, Carson fought a rear guard action and basically convinced ADCO to stay on board because we were out. They, they, they dropped the band. And they, they got together over the Christmas, worked out some, some sort of thing with, with the deal in England and, and uh, basically sticky taped a deal together, kept us there for another record. Okay. And um, yeah, so that was, yeah, that was Phil and Michael doing it, you know. And I, I think, I think uh, Phil Carson's input and most definitely Michael Browning's input over the years in that very formative period in, in keeping the band going has... Um, has been very, very understated over the years. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, certainly, I, you know, forgotten about, you know, or uh, what's the right, right? Yeah, yeah, it, without Michael doing what he did, you know, I, you know, like I said, I don't think we're doing this interview now. Mm-hmm. It's very important, very important, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. integral to the right. band. What was it? What was it that he had as a quality as a as a manager? He just knew what he was doing. Mm. He was smart, mm. you know. He was a great businessman, you know. Um, you know, uh, why the split came with, from the band, I don't know. That was later on. Um, I, 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 you know, the band went with a, a, another management company, which, which was Lieber Krebs, which is a New York-based company, which was Aerosmith <laughs> Management. Very high-powered pay, management. Maybe they thought they needed, you know, you know, to break in America, they needed that, you know. Uh, to look at it now, the ends justifies the means, most certainly, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all the right decisions were made, the way the way thing is now. The band, you know, you couldn't imagine the band being any bigger than what it is now. Mm-hmm. So all the decisions that were made then by Malcolm or whatever, hey, they've, they've, they've called all the right shots, man. Malcolm's a smart cookie, you know. He's... Um, He's on the ball. Mm. Yeah. And you're, you were with the band for two years. Yeah, two and a bit. Yeah. What happened at the end? Well, I've got a fairly philosophical way of looking at it. And in essence, you know, my thoughts, uh, if, uh, if I was the right guy for the band, I'd still be there, you know. And, you know, uh, you know it certainly wasn't my choice. I, I was sacked from the band. Because the last thing I wanted to do was be out of the band. In fact, I made a, a comment to a mate of mine, um, Mick Cox, uh, before, before I left, and saying, you know, the only way I'm leaving the band is in a box, you know. Uh, and uh, But it was, you know, the guys, uh, getting back to that period, we just got kicked off the, the Black Sabbath tour. Uh, there was some problems with, you know, the Dirty Deeds in the States. So it was, there was tension around the band. And I, I think uh, on a few occasions, I think my... My commitment to the band was was questioned. Uh, I, in my heart, it was never, you know, I was as committed as I possibly could be. You know, uh, I was a bit of a social being. I, I could have backed off the social side a bit, sure, but, you know, I think with with the way Angus and Malcolm are, that they're just put on this earth to be, you know, create what they did, uh, and that their their commitment is just amazing. They're, they're, back in those days, that's the only time I can comment on. Uh, their commitment and work ethic is, is phenomenal and I think it's fairly easy for them to view people that uh, to be not committed enough and I think that's probably the main thing that uh, would have been viewed that I wasn't committed enough to what I was doing I you know I, I don't believe that was the case but uh, I think that the, the period come come up where there was time to make a change the guys had a few weeks off there were things going wrong 
And, you know, I'd stop short of saying I was a scapegoat. That, that would not be the case at all. But I, I think uh, Malcolm Angus made the decision there was time to make a change. And uh, I was it. Mm.